I just want to say a quick hello, and uh, then I'm going to turn it over to Hallie. My name is Richard Hyman, and I'm the president of Future Frogmen. This is a nonprofit that I founded. We're a 501c3 in the U.S., and our mission is to foster ocean ambassadors and future leaders. So we work hard on that. We've got a great team of volunteers, and we, uh, we really enjoyed our time last week with uh, participating in World Oceans Week. <clears throat> we hosted uh, three sessions last week, and we carried this one over from last Wednesday, its original scheduled date due to the, the STEM walkout, which we supported. And, uh, and uh, that's why we're convening today. So Hallie is going to uh, run the show today. She's going to moderate uh, our guests and uh, the Q&A and uh, also make a presentation on the work that she's been doing. So Hallie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, let me just say Hallie is a graduate student at uh, University of Connecticut in the Avery Point campus in Groton, Connecticut. And uh, she'll be finishing her master's in August, I believe. So congratulations on that. And uh, I'll turn it over to you, Hallie. Great, thanks, Richard. Um, yeah, so first I'm just gonna give a brief intro to my background in research, and then we're gonna turn it over to the panelists. All right. So as Richard said, I'm a master's student at the University of Connecticut studying oceanography. And specifically, I researched the vulnerability of Dungeness crabs to climate change using regional ocean model projections. So for those of you who don't know, Dungeness crabs are a West Coast species, and they range from Alaska to Central California, and they have a very complex life cycle. It begins with mating of adult males and females. And the females carry about 2 million eggs under their abdomen between the months of October and December. And these eggs then hatch into larvae between January and March. The first larval stage is called a zoea and it gets transported offshore where it then molts into a megalope and then the megalope are able to swim and settle back onto the shelf as juveniles between April and August. And the juveniles hang out for about two years before they reach sexual maturity and the cycle can start again. The females have a natural lifespan of eight to 10 years, whereas the males reach legal catch size for the fishery at about age four. And this is usually the most valuable single species fishery for the US West Coast every year. And although it's valuable, it also varies a lot as you can see in these fluctuations of the Oregon landings here. And it's thought that these large fluctuations may be caused by differences in larval recruitment, which could be driven by environmental conditions. And it's really important to look at climate change impacts for this species in particular, because the West Coast is already experiencing effects of ocean acidification and hypoxia, which is low oxygen events. And this is because the long-term global trends are being amplified during seasonal spring and summer upwelling. Upwelling occurs when winds blow from the north and pull the sea surface water offshore. So then water from the depth comes up to replace it. And this water has a signature of low oxygen and high carbon dioxide, as well as being very nutrient rich. And these nutrients stimulate phytoplankton blooms at the surface, which then die off and decompose at the bottom of the seafloor. And this decomposition consumes oxygen and also drives the pH even lower. Experiments in the literature suggest that early life stages will have the greatest consequence from exposure to low pH, shown here, and the eggs in megalope will have a medium response, whereas juveniles and adults are thought to be relatively resilient. Part of my work was using a larval transport model to predict exposure to low pH between present and future. So here I have particles starting off in the uh, nearshore environment where the adult females would carry their eggs. Um, and as the simulation runs, larvae are being transported by the water currents. And you can see pH is colored here um, with light green being high pH and dark green being low pH in the danger zone where we see impacts occurring. Um, these megalope are swimming now up and down as you can see the particles bouncing around. <clears throat> 
And my, the conclusion of this study was that vulnerability, um, which is on an index from one to nine, with nine being the highest, and it increases across all three stressors, low pH, low oxygen, and high temperature under future conditions, with uh, vulnerability to oxygen being the most severe overall, but the largest increase between present and future is seen for low pH. So that's all I wanted to share about my research for now. And I also just want to give a shout out to all my wonderful collaborators and funders. And there's my contact info if you have any questions specifically for me. Um, but now I'd like to introduce each of our panelists for our discussion. Let me just pull up my notes here. Um, so I'm going to start off with Stephen Tomasetti, who's a PhD student at Stony Brook studying effects of climate change on shellfish. So the floor is yours, Stephen. All right, great, thank you. Okay, everybody can see my screen all right and hear me. Um, thanks a lot, everybody, for attending. Um, as Hallie said, I'm Stephen, a PhD student at Stony Brook University. And I'm uh, pleased to have this opportunity to discuss my research, um, which involves the effects of coastal change and climate change on economically important shellfish and their habitats. And so we can think of the coastal zone as the crossroads between Earth's atmospheric, oceanic, and terrestrial systems. And of course, uh, human activity alters all three of these systems and in turn has an effect on coastal processes. Uh, in terms of the atmosphere, it's the combustion of fossil fuels uh, that's had the most profound effect. Um, and if we follow the black line here through the last 800,000 years, we can see two things. One, we are already well above uh, the atmospheric CO2 concentrations of recent history. And two, we're continuing to rise rapidly, um, as shown in the red here, and can expect to double atmospheric CO2 concentrations under a business as usual emission scenario by the end of the century. Um, so, of course, these changes are already impacting the atmosphere, leading to global warming, changes in precipitation, um, and changes in the deposition of nitrogen in the coast. And a lot of this extra heat and carbon in the atmosphere is being taken up by the open ocean, uh, which in the case of heat leads to sea surface uh, temperature, sea surface warming, um, and also ocean deoxygenation uh, as warming water holds less oxygen. In the case of carbon, it leads to ocean acidification and the decrease of ocean pH. Um, and that's shown here in this map. Under the same business as usual scenario, we can expect the ocean to decrease by about 0.4 pH units by the end of the century. But in addition to these atmospheric and oceanic influences in the coast, we have this additional influence that's caused by human activities on land. And it's really increasing the supply of nitrogen to the coast and causing uh, additional disruptions. Uh, the most significant change has been through uh, fertilizer use, uh, but also urbanization, agriculture, fossil fuel combustion, overfishing, all of these things certainly have an impact. Um, and this is all happening at a time in which humans are increasingly relying on seafoods for their nutrition, which we can see in this graph here. Uh, which shows the increase in seafood consumption that's twice the rate of population growth uh, globally. And around 90% of fish species, and to my knowledge, all of the shellfish species come from the coastal zone. Uh, but it's tough to know how these species uh, will respond to climate change and coastal change because the conditions of the coastal zone are always changing, they're very dynamic. For instance, here we see conditions fluctuating from uh, what we would consider to be normal oxygen conditions to very low oxygen conditions and uh, normal pH conditions to severely low pH, uh, not even acidified, well, acidified, but also acidic pH conditions um, on a daily basis with tides. And so I'm interested in coastal shellfish and to protect these species, we need to know how uh, warming, low oxygen, acidification, that all varies in space and time in the coast, and also how shellfish respond to these changes. And so I try to address these gaps by um, combining monitoring with experimentation. Uh, so bay scallops, for instance, is one of the species I work with, and they're known to be particularly sensitive to environmental fluctuations. So I use reflective infrared uh, sensors, or what I call the shellfish Fitbit, uh, to measure changes in the heartbeat rate of bay scallops. 
And these are in association with changes in temperature and dissolved oxygen levels. So if you look at this graph here, for instance, we have the diamonds, which show heartbeat rates of base gallops that are measured every 15 minutes in the environment, um, along with temperature that's in red. And we can see that the changes in heartbeat rate follow the changes in temperature uh, very nicely. And we can use instruments like these heartbeat rate sensors to try and pinpoint specific values or durations that would cause uh, scallop stress. Um, I also work in oyster reef habitat, uh, looking at changes in the coastal chemistry with time. Um, so here, for instance, on the graph on the right, we can see fluctuations in the oyster reef pH uh, and that they're more intense than the surrounding environment, um, especially over the day, night, and tidal cycles. And I'm still working on this, but it seems like uh, the difference in macroalgae cover, which is seen here on the left, um, in addition to uh, the metabolic uh, activity of oysters are driving these trends. And so finally, um, one more thing that I've been working with are um, blue crab larvae, uh, similar to Hallie, been working with some uh, crab crustacean larvae. Um, and in these experiments, I've uh, just bubbled some uh, experimental vessels with different combinations of tanked gases, uh, basically to create conditions um, uh, for blue crab larvae. Um, these conditions are control conditions in which they experience normal dissolved oxygen and normal pH conditions, um, low oxygen only conditions where they're only experiencing low oxygen but normal pH low pH only, and then the combination of low oxygen and low pH, which is the environmentally realistic um, scenario because uh, they're often experienced together. Um, in short, we found that in this combined treatment, um, there's a more severe consequences on blue crab larval survival than in the individual uh, stressor treatments. And these data have important policy implications um, because most of the DO and pH policy in the U.S. was created at a time before we were actually thinking about pH um, closely. And so uh, if you're interested in this, um, I'd encourage you to read our paper, which was recently published in Science, and it discusses this more in depth. Um, so that's it for me. But um, before I end, I just wanted to stress, you know, we're moving into uncharted territory, particularly in the coastal environment, um, which is hard to predict. And these long-term changes could affect the duration and magnitude of extreme events, uh, which can influence our fisheries, our economies, can have socioeconomic um, access issues. And it's crucial that we both uh, do this science, but also use the results to re-examine our policies um, so we can either mitigate or at least prepare for the potential changes. Uh, so thank you very much. Next up, we have Dr. Louise Cameron, who graduated from Northeastern last month, and she'll be talking about her work on marine bivalves and their response to ocean acidification. Okay, um, so yeah, my name is Louise Cameron. Um, I just finished my PhD at Northeastern, same as Jess. Um, you can find me on Twitter at LouiseCam93. Um, so I'm really interested in understanding how scallops can cope with climate change. Now you probably all recognize scallops as these um, delicious morsels that you'll see on your plate. Um, scallops are a super important species um, for US fisheries, um, but um, they actually normally look more like this. So a scallop is a bivalve mollusk. Um, bivalve means that they have these two shells. Um, I think that they're a really charismatic and interesting bivalve. They actually have over a hundred eyes. If you notice those little black dots along the edge of their shell, those are their eyes. They can also swim by um, opening and shutting their shell really fast. So they're a pretty fun animal to study. As I mentioned, they have these two large shells. Um, these shells are made of calcium carbonate. Um, and because of these shells, um, this species is particularly vulnerable to the effects of ocean acidification. Um, they build these shells from calcium and carbonate ions in seawater and combine them to form calcium carbonate, which is a uh, mineral. However, ocean acidification is limiting the amount of biologically available carbonate in the water column. And without this carbonate, they can't build their shells as well. Um, so as I mentioned, this species is really important for our economy. In 2018, their fishery generated more than, 400, more than $400 million in profits. 
Um, and a lot of that revenue is generated right here in Massachusetts where I'm based. Um, so it's really important for our local economy. Um, the Atlantic sea scallop fishery takes place up and down the east coast of the United States, um, but a large portion of it takes place on Georgia's Bank, which is this elevated region that extends around about um, 200 kilometers offshore. You can see we've got Massachusetts in the top left corner up here with Cape Cod sticking out. And Georgia's Bank is a really interesting region because it has very complex oceanography. So it has this strong depth gradient um, from the shallowest depth being around 30 meters ranging down to 200 meters where it drops off the continental shelf. It has strong tidal currents. Um, it's subject to upwelling of low pH deep water onto the bank. And it has a wide variety of sediment types ranging from sand, shell and gravel that can um, buffer uh, local conditions um, at the benthos. Um, so because this region has such complicated oceanography, it's likely that it also has um, very variations in carbonate chemistry across the bank. Um, so variations in the amount of that carbonate ion that these bivalves use to build their shells. Um, however, Georgia's bank is a bit of a data gap. We have a lot of pre-existing data on carbonate chemistry in the Gulf of Maine to the north and in the Mid-Atlantic Bight to the south, but not as much on Georgia's bank. Um, so for my research, um, I first wanted to quantify the state of things on Georgia's bank. Um, so I went out on a commercial fishing boat and I collected seawater samples at 15 sites on the bank. Um, I collected them from depth and then I measured uh, the carbonate chemistry of the seawater. Um, so how much of that carbonate ion is available for the scallops. At each of my sites I also collected 50 scallops and then I looked at different um, properties. So I looked at their shell thickness, shell strength, tissue condition, um, gonadosomatic index which is a measure of reproductive um, output and I also measured um, their growth rate by looking at, by counting age lines on their shells. So this allowed me to survey the current state um, of Atlantic sea scallops across their, um, across their range on Georgia's bank. Um, I'll show you a couple images, a couple figures from that in a moment. The other um, side of my PhD was doing a tank experiment. Um, in the marine lab that I worked at, we have this really cool ocean acidification array. In each of these tanks, we can bubble mixtures of carbon dioxide and air into the seawater at different concentrations. And this allows us to simulate um, future conditions. Um, so we can take a look into the future and put different marine organisms under these scenarios. We can also alter te temperature as well. Um, so in my experiment, I kept scallops at three different temperatures and three different CO2 concentrations. Um, that simulated um, present day, a uh, near term future scenario um, and an extreme acidification scenario. Um, and again, I didn't put much data on my slides, but in this experiment, I found that um, their calcification rates declined under ocean acidification, so they weren't growing as fast. In fact, in my uh, most extreme acidification conditions, they were actually losing shell weight. So their shells were dissolving back into the seawater. Um, I also found increases in mortality, both in response to temperature and CO2. So warming and ocean acidification together were causing um, increases in death rates amongst my scallops. Um, now I'm just going to show you one of the starkest um, results that I found in my field study. So um, we, I also had access to a scanning electron microscope that allows me to take um, really high resolution up close images of the shell's surfaces. So this is um, the inside of a scallop shell at uh, 15,000 times magnification and each of these um, little rectangular things is a calcite crystal. Calcite is the type of calcium carbonate that scallops use to build their shells. So you can see in this image um, these crystals are really well defined, um, they have nice um, uniform edges they're overlapping a lot. And this um, gives the scallop shell a lot of structural integrity and makes it really strong. Um, this image is taken from our highest carbonate saturation state site. And now I'm gonna show you an image from our lowest saturation state site. And you can see in this image that those crystals are really disorganized now. It's hard to tell one crystal apart from the other. Um, they have signs of dissolution along the edges. 
I also tested the strength of these shells with an Instrong, which is a type of crushing machine. And I found that the shells from our lower carbonate saturation state sites were significantly weaker than at our higher carbonate saturation state sites. So this means that these scallops could be um, easier targets for predators in the future. Um, yeah, that's all I've got and I'll happily take questions in our discussion. Thanks. So we'll jump on over to Dr. Jessica Tarosian, who graduated from Northeastern in April um, and studied blue muscle responses to climate change and is now a policy analyst at DOT. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon. Um, thanks everyone for coming today. Um, I just completed my PhD in the Helmuth Lab at Northeastern University um, at the Marine Science Center in Nahant. Um, and my research focused on blue muscles, as Helly mentioned, but sort of within the framework that we do in that lab of ecological forecasting. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about ecological forecasting. Um, and so basically the idea behind ecological forecasting is that we're using a combination of field experiments, um, lab experiments, um, and some computer models to try to understand how species are go going to respond to future changes. Um, and similar to what Stephen was talking about, we basically in the lab can really stress out the animals and do a stress test similar to what your doctor would do um, for you at, at a hospital. Um, we test heart rate, we test feeding rate, respiration rate, um, and then also sort of how well um, an organism is able to assimilate the energy that they're taking in from food. And then we can use these in different models such as dynamic energy budget models or scope for growth to try to understand how species are going to grow and reproduce under these conditions that we're seeing in the fields and in the lab. Um, one of the things that's really um, important um, is that we're looking at, um, when we're looking at these animals in the intertidal, we are trying to understand kind of what their thermal response is. And unlike us, we regulate our body temperatures. Most of these species um, are actually subject to weather conditions. They're what we call ectotherms. And they rely on um, their shape and their size to sort of modulate how they respond to things like air temperature, solar radiation, wind speed. Um, and you can see from this um, presentation that um, the way that two different animals on the rock at the same spot might be experiencing very different temperatures. For example, a mussel might be much, much hotter than their predator, a sea star. And I'm actually realizing I'm sharing the wrong presentation with you. So I'm going to very quickly stop sharing. And then I'm gonna jump back into the presentation that I intended to share. Sorry about that. My apologies. There you go. That one was gonna be much longer. Um, and so I'm gonna jump ahead. So to try to correct for these issues with, um, with thermal temperatures that we're reading in the field, um, we create what we call robo-loggers. And what we're trying to do is match sort of the thermal inertia and the thermal conditions of a temperature logger to the, to the actual biological way that these animals are experiencing temperatures. Um, and unmatched loggers, so um, you can see that this logger in the um, lower left-hand corner is small and shiny, and that's gonna interact with those environmental variables in a very different way from a muscle, which is you know, a little bit bigger um, black in absorbing solar radiation in a very different way. And you can actually get unmatched um, errors of you know, greater than 14 degrees Celsius but when you start to try to mirror those thermal um, conditions, you actually get much closer to what the animal is actually experiencing in the field. And in this case, what we're trying to do um, is match the conditions of the blue mussel. And um, similar to what Stephen was talking about, blue mussels are really important from a fisheries perspective. They're very important to the Gulf of Maine um, shelf fishery, as well as Canada. They're also what we call a, a cosmopolitan species. They're distributed all over the world and are very important, not only for food for humans, but for um, other species as well. They're foundational species. They help bring in nutrients from the, from the bottom up into um, an ecosystem and they form these really dense bed habitats. They're also a really good sentinel species for climate change because they have such a broad 
um, thermal tolerance range um, that you can see here. Hey Jess, we can't actually see your screen anymore. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. That's okay. I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> Thank you. As we were just talking about um, problems with technology. Let's see, that's better. There you go. Um, so yeah, the thermal tolerance limit is, you know, and I've actually measured thermal tolerance actually higher and lower than this. It really depends on sort of how long these animals are exposed. But um, the muscles in my experiments are dying in air um, at around 42 degrees C um, and are surviving depending on the population down to even minus 17 or minus 19 C um, in the winter. So during my experiments, I wanted to look at how muscles in the Gulf of Maine were doing. Um, if you talk to a lot of researchers in this area over the past 30 years, they've noticed a lot of declines in muscle populations. Um, so I split up the Gulf of Maine into two regions, um, the north and the south. And typically we would expect to see a thermal gradient um, in the temperatures that these animals are experiencing. But um, my, my professor did work on the west coast and found that, that muscles are actually, because of the inconsistencies in tidal timing, um, as well as sort of how they're shaped and how they're oriented on the rock face, there's actually a lot of patchiness and there's some unexpected hot spots. So this is what one of these looks like um, in the summer in northern Maine. There's, they're very dense. Um, they're very different than what we see sort of down here closer to um, Massachusetts. But they're still thriving kind of up in Baymans. And I wanted to understand why this was happening. So I deployed a bunch of those um, temperature loggers that I think you weren't able to see, but um, this is what they look like. I, I ended up making my own system to be able to get um, 76 loggers out in the field um, in a variety of conditions as well. We wanted to try to understand how these animals were surviving, not just in the summer to extreme heat stress, but in the winter to extreme cold stress. Um, and what I found is that in the summertime, we're typically seeing that gradient pattern, um, as you would expect. But in the winter, during really severe cold snaps like this one that you're seeing depicted in this picture, um, this ice in the north actually acts as an, um, as an insulator. And so counterintuitively, in the winter during really severe cold snaps that are likely to result in high mortality, um, the muscles in the north are more protected and tend to stay closer to, um, to zero C. And in the south, because this ice barrier isn't as So that's just part of the research that I did. I didn't really include much results because I felt like having just offended, I could have talked for a very long time. Um, but I did also want to say, since we did um, shut down last week, just would really encourage you to go to shutdownstem.com and um, check out their resources for improving um, Black lives in STEM, as well as um, trying to help end systemic racism in academics. Next, I'd like to introduce Callie Concannon, who's a master's student at the University of Connecticut with me. And she will be talking about her studies on ocean acidification impacts for the Atlantic silver side. Start, there we go. Okay, so my name is Callie Concannon, and as Hallie was saying, I'm a master's student at UConn Avery Point um, in Hannes Baumann's lab, and I study how um, increased ocean temperatures and ocean acidification together impact growth and reproductive output in the Atlantic silver side. So a little bit about the silver side first. Um, they're pretty small coastal fish and they're uh, super abundant in coastal areas from Nova Scotia down to Northern Florida. And they're a common bait fish. They feed on smaller organisms like copepods and brine shrimp. And then they're subsequently fed on by larger um, sports fish like striped bass. And they became an important model species to study climate change impacts on coastal fish because they are small and easy to catch and they're super abundant close to home and they're easy to raise in captivity and they're also an annual fish so their lifespan is generally one year sometimes two tops um, which makes studying long-term exposures uh, a lot easier and as Stephen was saying uh, coastal areas are very dynamic so a lot of what climate models are projecting for increased temperature and um, pH for the upcoming years a lot of coastal areas are already experiencing this. So this is a time series across five years in Mumford Cove, which is where 
we collect our silver sides in Groton, Connecticut. And I have average C temperature in red, dissolved oxygen in blue, and then pH in green. And um, the area I have highlighted here is the silver side spawning season. So we're seeing that at the beginning of the silver side spawning season, the pH is relatively high and temperature is relatively low and it's less variable. But as you move towards the end of um, their spawning season, there's a lot more variability and the pH has dropped and the temperature starts to increase. And we're seeing pHs that are in these projection models. So we're seeing pHs as low as 7.5 that they're experiencing at least on it for daily time scale, but even some seasonal fluctuations. Um, and silver sides are batch spawners, so they spawn every two weeks in here. And so even though they're experiencing these conditions already, they're predicted to experience these conditions more frequently as time goes on. So how would these changes over a long-term exposure impact the local fish? And most of the research done on silver sides already have focused on shorter time scales, predominantly their early life stages from eggs, larvae, and juveniles. Uh, but there's a general knowledge gap in long-term exposure. So if they're exposed, growing up in a low pH, high temperature environment from an egg to a spawning adult, how does that impact the species? Which is the question I aim to address. And there's also a knowledge gap in how these long-term exposures impact the amount of offspring that the, the species can produce. I don't know if you guys can hear this in the background, but one of my neighbors is moving. So if there's any loud bangs, it's them. Um, so the overall, the question I aim to address was how long-term um, low pH, high temperature environments being in these environments from egg to spawning adult impacts both their growth and then also their reproductive output. So how many eggs are they producing and what sizes are they? And past research on shorter time scales have shown that silver sides are relatively tolerant to these exposures. Um, and given that they, these aren't uncommon values for them to experience, we anticipated that there would be no effect on their growth and reproduction. So how do we study um, the silver side? First, we capture wild silver sides using a sanding net seen in the left. Uh, we then bring them back to the lab and artificially spawn them and then raise them in tanks seen on the right under a variety of temperature and pH conditions. So my conditions are in the table below. Um, the temperatures I picked were 17 and 24 degrees Celsius and the pHs were 7.5 and 8.2. So 17 degrees Celsius and a pH of 8.2 are like the beginning of their spawning season when things are less variable and then the 24 and 7.5 are the end of their spawning season. Um, what projection models are predicting will become more um, frequent for them to experience. So I raised them in these conditions for 11 months. Uh, and then after 11 months, I measured their total length, which is their length from their snout to the tip of their tail, their weight, and a gonadosomatic index, which is the percent of their um, body weight that is their reproductive organs. And I also took a deeper dive into the female reproduction and looked at how many eggs they're producing, what sizes those eggs are, and what developmental stages those eggs are in. So I have some pictures of some fish eggs here. So I counted and measured all the um, eggs in the ovaries for the females. And being a batch spawner, you see a lot of wide range of sizes. Um, so being batch spawners, you have this big peak in very small egg sizes, and then you see another peak later on of like larger sizes, and there's a wide range in between of all these different sizes. Because batch spawners, technically, they like take from that smaller group, start growing up a group of eggs, and then spawn it, and then two weeks later, we do the same thing. So I looked at both the uh, maximum size of the eggs, the minimum size of the eggs, the overall range, if there was any difference in those ranges across these tank treatments. And then developmentally, I looked at um, what developmental stages these eggs were in, and if there was an effect on how, what sizes the eggs were in those stages, and also um, if they were reaching the same developmental stages. So, as I said before, we anticipated that growing up in these high temperature, low pH environments would result in no effect, but we actually are seeing some significant effects. 
So in these warmer, more acidic environments, um, we're seeing that the females and males are growing larger and heavier, but their gonadosomatic indexes are smaller. Uh, the females are also producing a lot more eggs, but they're on average of a smaller size. Uh, I'm still analyzing those uh, egg size ranges, but it looks like there may be a small shift, but if it's significant or not, I'm unsure of right now. And then developmentally, they're all reaching the same developmental stages in their ovaries. All the eggs are reaching the appropriate stages and there's, they seem to be around the same size. So that's not being affected by the temperature and pH. Um, overall, there's lots of variability in this study, but there are some clear pH and temperature effects that we're seeing. And I just want to thank my lab group for helping me out through all this because there was a lot of fish over a year to take care of. Awesome. Thanks, Callie. And last but not least, we have Dr. Matthew Suzaki, who is at UConn with me and Callie and just defended his PhD on Monday. So congrats. He'll be talking about thermal adaptation in copepods. There we go. Now I'm unmuted. Awesome. Thanks, Callie. Um, and Hallie for, for the introduction. Um, so yeah, like Hallie mentioned, I just finished my PhD in oceanography over at UConn. Um, but I, my background is in evolutionary biology. Um, and so the main questions in my research aren't directly related to or aren't directly focused on vulnerabilities to climate change. But one of the things that I think is really important is that we remember sort of, or that we think about how evolutionary dynamics might influence vulnerability to climate change. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about today a little bit, which essentially boils down to this question of why do plankton do what they do? Mm -hmm. And just to make sure we're all on the same page, I'll remind people what plankton are, right? Plankton is really diverse group of organisms that are defined by how they live, right? The fact that they live suspended in the water column. And, um, we care about plankton because things like phytoplankton form the base of the food webs, uh, which provide energy for animals like zooplankton, and then eventually animals like fish. Um, but one of the things that I like to point out is just the fact that plankton are so diverse. Right, we tend to lump them into these groups like phytoplankton and zooplankton, but it's eye-opening to put a water sample uh, sort of under the microscope and just look at how many different things are living in, in the water that you wouldn't normally be able to see, right? Most of these animals are um, less than half the size of a grain of rice. Uh, so I could spend all day talking about plankton and how cool they are, but uh, I'll, stop and I'll introduce the animals that I work with, right? I work with one uh, particular group of planktonic organisms called copepods. Uh, there's a illustration of just a couple of the more diverse types of copepods um, shown here. Um, but yeah, so the, the main thing about copepods is they're super diverse, they're super abundant, right? Copepods are the most abundant animals in the ocean, if not on the entire planet. Um, and I think that they're just fascinating animals to, to study. Um, they're also important animals to study. The reason why we spend time and effort studying copepods is because they are such an important food source for fish. Right? Callie mentioned that silversides eat copepods um, and then pass that energy up to larger fish. But copepods are also a direct food source for things like whales. Right? In the cooler, high latitude waters, copepods get bigger and can be a really important food source for things like North Atlantic right whales. And the other reason copepods are super important for the way the ocean works is because they're so abundant, because there are so many copepods in the ocean, they actually play a role in how elements cycle through, um, through marine systems, right? Uh, copepods take carbon from phytoplankton, package it into these torpedo-like hydrodynamic fecal pellets, um, which can carry carbon from the surface waters to deep waters, right, where it's sequestered for long periods of time. Uh, I am working with copepods as part of my, uh, I, I worked with copepods as part of my PhD uh, because they're so widely distributed. Um, and 
this is important for me because my research tends to take on two broad areas, asking how organisms do what they do by looking at the relationships between DNA, um, the genes that they encode, and how those genes um, eventually lead to differences in how organisms function. Uh, the other question that I tend to ask that my research focuses on is why organisms do what they do, and this is where evolution comes in. Uh, right? Large-scale patterns in the environment, either over spatial scales or temporal scales like um, seasonality, uh, those patterns in the environment shape patterns in adaptation right? over evolutionary timescales. And ultimately, evolution, in my mind, is why organisms do what they do. Right? The process of natural selection over time shapes what organisms do. Um, and so copepods are an awesome model system to study these two questions in because they're so abundant, they're super widely distributed, and they have a, a really short generation time, right? Just less than a month in most cases. Okay, um, the last thing that I want to touch on before I uh, highlight a, a little bit of my work um, has to do with genetics. Um, to an evolutionary biologist, in, in many ways, organisms are just vessels for genes, right? We all carry around our DNA, and at some point, the goal is to replicate your genes for the next generation. Um, and this is actually really important to think about when we're dealing with planktonic organisms because they're being carried around by currents, right? This is from a really cool simulation from NASA about how currents move through the ocean. Um, and all of this water movement as it moves throughout the oceans is carrying planktonic organisms with, with uh, in the water, right? And as those organisms are moved around, their genes are being moved around as well. And because the genes have such a strong impact on what organisms do, when we're looking at patterns in, in adaptation, uh, gene flow is also an important thing to, to consider, right? So how these genes are being moved around is also going to shape patterns in what we see organisms doing. So um, those are kind of the central themes for my research. There's a couple of projects that I've worked on that I want to highlight. Um, as an undergrad, I worked with this little tiny copepod that lives in tide pools called Tigriopus, um, looking at patterns in thermal adaptation. Um, I spent some time working with Antarctic invertebrates doing um, uh, uh, sort of reduced genome sequencing to look at patterns in gene flow and so how connected are sites across the southern ocean and then all of that kind of gets combined in uh, what was my dissertation project looking at this copepod Akashitansa in the North Atlantic. So I don't have too much data to show but uh, one of the things that I did for my dissertation was go out and collect a Akashitansa, collect these live animals from the Gulf of Mexico up the Atlantic um, and then into Canadian waters. So that covers this really large temperature gradient, right? So these animals are found across crazy different environments. We were able to bring them back to the lab and then measure things like thermal tolerance, which is essentially the temperature, the upper limit, right? The upper temperature that organisms could handle living at. And then I was able to compare thermal tolerance between populations. So that's what we see here is that there's some large variation between populations across this um, environmental gradient. Uh, we also found evidence for gene flow, right? These are populations that don't have different thermal tolerances. We did some um, genetics that showed that there's enough connectivity to keep, um, to essentially prevent adaptive divergence from happening. Uh, one of the other elements of this project was comparing male and female thermal tolerance. Um, and we actually found that males always have lower thermal tolerance than females, um, which has interesting consequences for things like uh, vulnerability to climate change. And then the other main aspect of my dissertation that I want to touch on is seasonal variation, right? So Callie mentioned uh, how seasonal um, Long Island Sound is, right, specifically Mumford Cove, which is coincidentally where I was collecting copepods for my entire dissertation, for most of my dissertation. Um, and so I was able to piggyback off of that environmental data set that she showed um, and use that to look at how copepods in Long Island Sound respond to that seasonal variation. Um, 
with silver sides and sort of their generation time of a year, they experience that entire range of environmental conditions within a generation. Copepods don't do that, right? With a generation time of only a month, now they experience those range of temperatures between generations. Um, and so that means that there's the potential for evolutionary dynamics to kind of take over when, it, when we're looking at what copepods are doing throughout um, this annual temperature cycle. Um, and so I know that the graphs are a lot. And so the main two take home messages and how I've related my work on sort of the evolution of thermal tolerance to vulnerability to climate change. Um, one of the things that we found is that spatial patterns um, in vulnerability are going to be affected by things like patterns in selection, right? And, and patterns in gene flow, um, which are important to consider when we're thinking about sort of big picture vulnerability. Um, the other main take home point that relates to vulnerability to climate change is that seasonal variation in temperature um, and other environmental factors could be uh, an evolutionary force that creates and maintains adaptive genetic variation. Um, and so it essentially primes populations or it might help populations respond to new conditions by maintaining a lot of diversity um, within a population. And so I'll um, end there. There's a bunch of people I want to thank. I, a lot of my work was funded through um, um, our department, Yukon Marine Sciences, as well as um, grant money from NSF and Sea Grant. So now that we've heard from each of the panelists, we'll move on to the Q&A part of this discussion. Um, so first, I want to just pose some questions to the panelists, and I'll try to save the last few minutes for any questions from the audience. Um, so as Richard and Jess mentioned, we had to postpone our um, discussion a week because we wanted to observe shutdown STEM. Um, so the first question I wanted to start off with was, what can our institutions do to improve diversity in our field so that minorities have a voice in the battle against climate change? I think that I'll maybe jump in with sort of the, the simpler end of the spectrum is in my mind, reducing the emphasis on things like GPA and test scores, right? I think that there's no, like one of the nice things about being scientists is that we know how to look at data and there's no data to support the test scores or GPA are good predictors of success. Um, and so the fact that applications rely a lot on those as the base indices, um, I think is an issue and uh, doesn't need to be how we structure the process of getting in into STEM um, as a career. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead, Louise. Oh, sorry. I was just going to jump on the back, off the back of that and say one of the things that's a real issue in marine science is that um, it takes a lot of privilege to get into our field. Like one of the main ways that um, we get experience to become marine scientists is doing paid internships. Uh, or even there's a lot of field courses out there that you have to pay a lot of money to, you know, go collect data. And so it it creates this imbalance where people who can afford to do marine science end up doing marine science. So, you know, addressing that would be a good place to start. Another thing is going off the back of um, GRE scores. GREs are really expensive um, and you can get a G good GRE score if you take it again and again and again. Um, but if you can't afford to do that, um, then that again creates a systemic problem in our field. Yeah, I was going to say something similar to Louise about the unpaid internships. And that's something that I know we've tried to rectify at Northeastern. Um, initially in my lab, we applied for some NSF funding to allow us to offer um, paid internships for um, students from Lynn, which is a nearby community that has a lot of sort of um, low income students as well as underrepresented minorities. And we participated with the Beach Sisters program at, at Girls Inc. to provide those opportunities. But you know, in addition to just providing the funding, you have to be aware that there's a lot of situations in terms of transportation, um, in terms of whether their parents work an overnight shift. Those are all things that you just need to be aware of and be accommodating for. I think sometimes when you're doing research, you're like, well, we have to be up at this time and research happens. And if you want to be in the field, you got to show initiative. But like, there's a lot of little small things that we can do to just be more understanding of people's 
situations and being proactive and educating ourselves about the barriers that exist. I wanted to make one more point about the application process. Um, I thought this was actually very interesting. I was speaking with a friend of mine who's a new professor at, um, at a university in the South, and she was talking about um, how when she looks for students, um, she reads all of the applications, not just um, looks at students who reach out to her directly. And her reasoning for that was that, um, you know, the application process is sort of this mysterious process in which you submit an application, but you also must reach out to professors in advance, discuss their research, talk about your interests. And a lot of first generation students don't necessarily know about that. And there's not always an explicit direction to do so. Um, but oftentimes professors won't even consider an application if they haven't already spoken at length to the to the graduate student. And I just thought, you know, that's a great point and we should be thinking about uh, making the application process um, more transparent for all students so that they know um, so that they can be considered on an equal playing field um, and not you know put at a disadvantage just because um, they were unaware of um, sort of the unspoken uh, guidelines to applying. Yeah, and we've also started reading our intern applications blind. Um, our lab technician will go through and remove the names. Um, so we're not, and some of the gender identifiers so that we're not even sure kind of like who we're reading about, just reading about their accomplishments. Awesome, thank you for sharing your thoughts about that. Um, so my first question about climate change research was a lot of us talked about measuring individual responses to climate change in a laboratory setting, but how can we actually scale up those individual responses to an ecosystem level that's relevant for management and policy? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, one of the things that we find with um, ocean acidification and warming as well is that, of course, not all species react the same ways. In fact, different calcifiers can react in different ways to ocean acidification. For example, bivalve sighted scallops that I study tend to show reduced growth rates under ocean acidification, whereas some echinoderms and crustaceans actually show increased growth rates under acidification. Now, that might make you, that might lead to the thought that, you know, all bivalves are gonna um, get, you know, experience really huge predation rates in the future. But then if you combine these species in experiments, you sometimes find that predator behavior changes and they're not able to find their prey. So I think that one thing that's really only started to be looked into in the last five, five years or so is looking at predator-prey interactions in tech experiments and seeing how behavior changes as well, because um, it's hard to, just look at individual responses separately and uh, meaningfully say how those species will interact. Uh, my, uh, my research focuses on individual as sort of individuals within a population, right? And so scaling from individual responses to populations, which can then scale up to community levels can also be really challenging, especially for marine organisms that aren't easy to grow in the lab, right? The amount of work that everyone on this panel has done to keep animals alive in the lab is uh, not, uh, uh, it's not something to, to uh, shake a stick at, right? It's a ton of work. Um, but I also think that it's important that it's the individual variability, sort of the variation between individuals that will also influence response to climate change. Um, and so taking that into account, it ends up being a matter of statistics, right? Being able to have enough animals to, um, enough individuals to, to run experiments with, um, which can be challenging. And it's definitely something that I think uh, needs, we're working towards solutions for, right? Yeah, and I think that that's, our lab sort of has another, like a third focus on incorporating modeling and you know there's that famous quote that like all models are wrong but some are useful and um, one of the first things I did in, as part of my PhD was do a review of um, forecasting models and trying to merge 
how do you think about the top-down models that use sort of correlation between species distributions? Because for those of us that look at the individuals and we see how much inter-individual variability, I think Kelly even mentioned that, it's really hard sometimes for us to find statistical differences, even though we can kind of see that they're there. You're so obsessed with the individual that sometimes you poo-poo these top-down models, but we kind of need to take both into account and start to see maybe where there's agreements between our bottom-up models that are predicting individual to population level responses and where those are agreeing um, with the kind of more correlational responses and maybe that can help us at least target areas that we are really certain are very important or are likely to become kind of a point of constriction for a species. Yeah, this uh, certainly isn't my area of expertise, but um, just a little bit more on modeling. Um, I think Luis probably is very is aware of this, but I, I was thinking as you were asking the question about um, uh, Sarah Cooley's group, who's um, who works on modeling some modeling, and they model um, they did an integrative assessment model with uh, with sea with sea scallops, Atlantic sea scallops. And what they do is they take um, you know the measurements that we make in the lab. And they use those relationships to inform these models, and then the models predict change over time. Um, and they can, you know, uh, look at that. You know, they can hindcast and look at it in the past and see how well it aligns with previous data. And then they can forecast and look into the future. And um, although that's not my my area of specialty, I think that's an important point that like we all sort of work together. We, some of us who might be working on with individuals and experiments find these relationships and then those relationships get plugged into models where you know as a coefficient or something um, that impacts the model and um, um, I think you know it's important that we just kind of uh, keep in mind that um, everyone's contributions matter and that together as we all sort of um, figure things out we can get a better picture of you know the, uh, what really may be happening out there. Um, and we kind of always have to take our results with a grain of salt and recognize that it fits into a larger uh, picture that might be beyond our um, viewpoint. Great, yeah, interdisciplinary research is particularly important in oceanography. Um, so I wanted to ask a question about adaptation and I saw in the chat that Purnima also asked a question about that. So I'm gonna pose her question to y'all. Um, can continuous exposure to climate change develop adaptive features in marine organisms? That's a great question. Um, I think, you know, that's the, the, that's a question that all of us are asking a lot because um, I know particularly working on the coast, I'll just speak from experience, you know, like I mentioned in my uh, little talk. There's a lot of variability and the environment is very dynamic. So in some ways you think that, you know, potentially animals that uh, exist in the coast are exposed to a larger range of um, conditions and thus might be more adapted to, um, you know, future changes. Uh, but also at the same time, sometimes what we, what we learn is that uh, they might just, they might not be better adapted and they might just be closer to the to the end of that range of their tolerance. Um, so, you know, I think it depends on individuals, depends on their prior proximate history, it depends on their adaptive evolutionary history. And we're talking about, you know, different time scales. looking at, uh, you know, I loved what Matt was saying about, um, about the generation time, thinking about how, uh, you know, what's the range of conditions that one individual is exposed to in their uh, lifetime. Uh, I think all of those things are are interesting and important and uh, yeah, it certainly takes work to figure them out. Um, so to answer the question, uh, I think it's possible to develop adaptive features, but at the same time, um, uh, we also have to keep in mind that um, we're kind of going through a rate of change, like the rate of change of, of the environment is happening at a much faster rate than, uh, than uh, in the past. So whether or not animals are already prepared for this type of change this quickly um, is another question um, in which, you know, we don't necessarily have the best answers right now. Um, 
Yeah, in terms of fish too, like some are in the coastal environment as well. Some are doing really well, some are doing not so great, and some are already tolerant to the changes. So it's hard to say like if they're adapting or not, but also like some fish species are just leaving. They're just migrating out of the colder waters and finding a new habitat. So if it's really adaption or if they're just gonna get up and move is a bit of a difficult question to answer right now. And one of the things that's really difficult is that a lot of our species have planktonic dispers dispersion. So when they reproduce, they send their, you know, their eggs and sperm up in the water column, they fertilize there, and then they're kind of um, cast to the, to the currents. Um, but what we're, and with mussels, at least in Maine, we're finding that things are, there's a lot more localized retention of larvae, I think, than we had initially thought, um, especially with some of those embayments, um, just because of the way that the tides flow in and out. Um, it causes changes in the height of the plankton and they go back into the embayment. So there's, there's maybe more potential than we thought. Also, sometimes the eastern main coastal current flows in reverse. Um, so there can be some barriers depending on larval timing that prevent the larvae from flowing south as we would expect. So there's a lot of weird variability in the currents and until we kind of pinpoint what those are, we, we don't really even know necessarily. Yeah, and I would hop on the back of something that Stephen said earlier is it can often depend a lot on the environment that marine organisms have experienced in the past. For example, oysters often live in estuaries and estuaries experience these huge um, daily pH cycles um, that, where they're exposed to um, freshwater input versus seawater input. Um, so we find that oysters are often more tolerant to um, higher levels of ocean acidification compared to like the scallops that I study that um, experience much more stable conditions. Um, but that's something that we still are trying to wrap our heads around in tank experiments. It's really hard to add that level of variability even in temperature and also in CO2 in a tank experiment, we tend to look at stable conditions and look at the, you know, the effect of a stable condition over time when in reality, marine organisms are going to be experiencing more variable conditions. So something that we're still kind of wrapping our heads around. I also just want to add one more thing because that just popped an idea in my head that uh, I think is really important and it's that, um, actually, I just forgot it. Hold on one second. Oh, it's not always the mean conditions that are that are necessarily the most important. Sometimes it's the extremes. And so even in these extremely variable environments, um, you know, future change might change the, the duration of an extreme exposure or might change the magnitude of an extreme exposure. And if those animals are, are close to their kind of the limits of their tolerance range, um, even animals that are exposed to high levels of variability might uh, be still vulnerable to uh, future ocean change or, you know, or coastal change for that matter. Um, so I think I'm just going to ask one more question and then I'll turn it over to the audience because we're coming up on the end of our time. Um, my last question was, how can this research be used to inform decision making and management and policy? I'm going to start this one just because I sort of had no idea until I started working on the policy side, kind of how these decisions got incorporated and it was really um, eye opening for me. Um, there's in terms of what gets considered a policy standpoint, um, a lot of the focus is on endangered species um, in terms of trying to pinpoint kind of those individual species tolerance limits and how much they can handle in terms of acidification, temperature, um, sedimentation, that kind of thing that kind of gets incorporated when there are endangered species impacts. Um, but where a lot of our species kind of fall under um, are sort of the essential fish habitat regulations that NOAA oversees and that incorporates like a much wider group of species. And so they're just, they're trying to make sure that the impacts to the environment are minimized for things like shellfish and nursery habitat and anadromous um, fish species. So that's sort of where like all those little bits of research would probably go into a very long form like biological document that then gets roped into some policy about how they need to put certain protections out if they're doing a certain type of project or 
um, if, how they would need to mitigate for any um, unavoidable impacts to that resource. So that's kind of how I've started to see where our research would fit in as I've been learning more about the process. Yeah, and I think that our, our research is also very applicable to like fisheries management and agriculture and um, recently there have been a number of really great partnerships where academic or academic institutions or scientists are reaching out to managers um, or agriculturists before they design their experiments um, to find out what they specifically need to know. And a really good example of this is um, a study that was done on the West Coast uh, with Pacific oysters at the Whiskey Creek Oyster Hatchery, where um, oyster hatcheries on the West Coast were experiencing mortalities of their larvae. Um, and they weren't sure why, they weren't sure whether it was um, disease or what was really going on. Um, so they collaborated with some scientists at Oregon State University that measured different parameters in the water. And one of the things that they measured was pH and uh, calcium carbonate saturation state. And they found that, um, well, the West Coast is this, has this really strong um, upwelling. So it's this upwelling region that gets periodic um, upwelling of low pH deep water um, onto the shore. And they were finding that when the upwelling was really strong, pH was dropping, and that was when they were seeing these um, dives with larvae. Um, and with that knowledge, the um, agriculturists were then able to buffer, um, to mitigate that. They were able to buffer the water during those low pH times. They were able to monitor it more closely and switch off inflow, for example, um, when pH was particularly low. And it's by, you know, partner making and maintaining close partnerships with um, industry and with uh, policymakers that we can really make a difference. Yeah, I also think that um, studying like how much of their reproductive output is impacted by these long, longer term exposures can help us gain a better understanding of like what's around for the next generation. And then like could probably help with like catch laws and stuff like that to see how many fish are going to be around. Awesome. So I think now um, I'll turn it over to the audience. If there are any questions, you can either type in the chat box or unmute yourself and ask. Um, while I'm waiting for people to think of their questions, we have one question from Vaithi in the chat box. Are there models to predict ocean pH levels with rising atmospheric CO2 concentrations? Um, and I, I can probably answer that for us all. Um, so there are global scale ocean models that can be used to predict ocean pH using um, some predicted rising PCO2 concentrations. There are different pathways that the IPCC uses um, to look at, you know, if we keep going business as usual, what will ocean pH look like versus if we do some mitigation. Um, and then we also can have regional ocean scale models that can zoom in on our particular area. So the model I use is for the West Coast specifically. Um, it has a really high horizontal resolution and allows us to see um, spatial variation in pH, which is awesome. And we can validate those against observations in the present um, so that we have good faith in our models when we look out into the future. Uh, so if thank anyone you. has a oh, question. Thank you. Oh, yes. yeah, you're welcome. Can I ask you a follow-up question on that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I see that in the ocean acidification experiments, the range of pH was uh, varying from about 6.8 to 8.2 or pH units or so. So I assume that's the normal range of um, variation in ocean pH. So uh, do we have uh, models to predict how much the pH will drop in with uh, rising carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere? How much will a few more play, 10 more ppm in the atmosphere of CO2 affect ocean pH? For example, yeah. Yeah, so I think the prediction um, on a global scale for the next 100 years um, is that the pH will drop by 0.3 units. And again, this is exacerbated on the coastal region. Um, and we can use these models to see specifically like what pH will look like in a particular area because it might look different. I also think it's a good, it's a good point to know that, um, you know, that's under like the business as usual scenario. Mm -hmm. um, 
but actually pH is one of the more, um, I don't know what the best way to put it, pH is one of the things that if we were to uh, try and uh, really curb our carbon emissions, would, ne would not necessarily, uh, we could mitigate quite a bit of the pH change um, over time uh, as compared to like temperature and some of the other things. Um, actually it, curbing emissions now can um, prevent this additional point uh, three to four unit drop that we expect to see by the end of the century, um, which is encouraging on the one hand and discouraging when we think about how little change has happened uh, on the other. But, um, uh, you know, there's a, a great deal of effort going into these models and they predict that a whole bunch of range of um, emissions uh, scenarios. Um, so, you know, they do the business as usual, which just continue to rise, but then they have like these kind of middle ground ones. And you can see if you go to the IPCC um, reports, it's like, a, it's a international panel on climate change. They publish all of these uh, open so you can look and see, but they'll give you um, different scenarios and um, different pH changes uh, uh, along with each scenario. We're set. Yeah. Um, Hallie, uh, great, great job. Uh, and Matthew, Louise, Jessica, Stephen, and Callie, uh, awesome job. And uh, to those of you who just uh, earned your PhDs, congrats to you. And those that are uh, um, close to uh, achieving that or your master's, congrats to you as well. You guys are all brilliant people and you're doing great work and it's important work. So we really appreciate you preparing and making the time for us, uh, not only last week, which we po postponed for a good cause, and I'm, I'm glad you guys spoke about that. It was excellent. And uh, talking about uh, the STEM walkout. And uh, thanks for uh, these great, great words today. And uh, we look forward to staying in touch with all of you. So thanks again, and everyone have a wonderful day. Thanks, Richard and Hallie, thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks for watching. For more information, visit our website at www.futurefrogman.org.